one of the three short plays presented on Zoom in May of this year by Dramatis Personae, Clive Brewer. Stately, plump Buck Mulligan came from the stairhead, bearing a bowl of lava on which a mirror and a razor lay crossed. A yellow dressing gown, ungirdled, was sustained gently behind him by the mild morning air. He held the bowl aloft and intoned, Introibo ad altare dei. Halted. He peered down the dark winding stairs and called out coarsely, Come up, Kinch! Come up, you fearful Jesuit! Solemnly he came forward and mounted to the round gun rest. He faced about and blessed gravely thrice the tower, the surrounding country and the awaking mountains. Then, catching sight of Stephen Dedalus, he bent towards him and made rapid crosses in the air, gurgling in his throat and shaking his head. Stephen Dedalus, displeased and sleepy, leaned his arms on the top of the staircase and looked coldly at the shaking, gurgling face that blessed him, equine in its length and at the light, untonsured hair, grained and hued like pale oak. Buck Mulligan peeked an instant under the mirror and then covered the bowl smartly. Back to barracks, he said sternly. He added in a preacher's tone, for this so dearly beloved is the genuine Christine, body and soul and blood and wounds. Slow music, please. Shut your eyes, gents. One moment. A little trouble about those white corpuscles. Silence, all. He peered sideways up and gave a long, low whistle of call, then paused a while in rapt attention, his even white teeth glistening here and there with gold points. Chrysostomos. Two strong, shrill whistles answered through the calm. Thanks, old chap. That will do nicely. Switch off the current, will you? He skipped off the gun rest and looked gravely at his watcher, gathering about his legs the loose folds of his gown. The plump shadowed face and sullen oval jowl recalled a prelate, patron of arts in the Middle Ages. A pleasant smile broke quietly over his lips. The mockery of it, he said gaily. Your absurd name, an ancient Greek. He pointed his finger in friendly jest and went over to the parapet, laughing to himself. Stephen Dedalus stepped up, followed him wearily halfway and sat down on the edge of the gun rest, watching him still as he propped his mirror on the parapet, dipped the brush in the bowl and lathered cheeks and neck. Buck Mulligan's gay voice went on. My name is absurd too, Malachi Mulligan. Two dactyls, but it has a Hellenic ring, hasn't it? Tripping and sunny like the buck himself. We must go to Athens. Will you come if I can get the aunt to fork out 20 quid? He laid the brush aside and, laughing with delight, cried, Will he come, the jejun Jesuit? Ceasing, he began to shave with care. Tell me, Mulligan, Stephen said quietly. Yes, my love. How long is Haynes going to stay in this tower? Buck Mulligan showed a shaven cheek over his right shoulder. God, isn't he dreadful? A ponderous Saxon. He thinks you're not a gentleman. God, these bloody English. Bursting with money and indigestion. Because he comes from Oxford. You know, Dedalus, you have the real Oxford manner. He can't make you out. Oh, my name for you is the best. Kinch, the knife blade. He shaved wearily over his chin. 
He was raving all night about a black panther, Stephen said. Where is his gun case? A woeful lunatic, Mulligan said. Were you in a funk? I was, Stephen said with energy and growing fear. Out here in the dark with a man I don't know, raving and moaning to himself about shooting a black panther. You saved men from drowning. I'm not a hero, however. If he stays on, here I am off. Buck Mulligan frowned at the lather on his razor blade. He hopped down from his perch and began to search his trouser pockets hastily. Scatter, he cried thickly. He came over to the gun rest and, thrusting a hand into Stephen's upper pocket, said, Lend us a loan of your nose rag to wipe my razor. Stephen suffered him to pull out and hold up on show by its corner a dirty crumpled handkerchief. Buck Mulligan wiped the razor blade neatly, then gazing over the handkerchief he said, The bird's nose rag, a new art colour for our Irish poets. Snot green. You can almost taste it, can't you? He mounted to the parapet again and gazed out over Dublin Bay, his fair oak pale hair stirring slightly. God, isn't the sea what algae calls it? A grey sweet mother, the snot green sea, the scrotum tightening sea, epio in opa ponton, ah, uh, Daedalus, the Greeks, <laughs> I must teach you. You must read them in the original. Thalata, Thalata. She is our great sweet mother. Come and look. Stephen stood up and went over to the parapet. Leaning on it, he looked down on the water and on the mail boat clearing the harbour mouth of Kingstown. Our mighty mother, Buck Mulligan said. He turned abruptly his great searching eyes from the sea to Stephen's face. The aunt thinks you killed your mother. That's why she won't have let me have anything to do with you. Someone killed her, Stephen said gloomily. You could have knelt down, damn it, Kinch, when your dying mother asked you. I'm Hyperborean as much as you, but to think of your mother begging you with her last breath to kneel down and pray for her, and you refused. There is something sinister in you. He broke off and lathered again lightly his father cheek. A tolerant smile curled his lips. What a lovely mama, he murmured to himself. Kinch, the loveliest mama of them all. He shaved evenly and with care, in silence, seriously. Stephen, an elbow rested on the jagged granite, leaned his palm against his brow and gazed at the fraying edge of his shiny black coat sleeve. Pain, that was not yet the pain of love, fretted his heart. Silently, in a dream, she had come to him after her death. Her wasted body within its loose brown grave clothes, giving off an odour of wax and rosewood. Her breath that had bent upon him, mute, reproachful, a faint odour of wetted ashes. Across the threadbare cuff edge he saw the sea hailed as a great sweet mother by the well-fed voice beside him. The ring of bay and skyline held a dull green mass of liquid. A bowl of white china had stood beside her deathbed, holding the green sluggish bile which she had torn up from her rotting liver by fits of loud groaning vomiting. Buck Mulligan wiped again his rosa blade. Ah, poor dog's body, he said in a kind voice. I must give you a shirt and a few nose rags. Oh, how are the second-hand breeks? They fit well enough, Stephen answered. Buck Mulligan attacked the hollow beneath his underlip. The mockery of it. Second leg they should be. <laughs> God knows what poxy bowsy left them off. 
I have a lovely pair with a hair stripe. Gray, you look spiffing in them. Well, I'm not joking, Kinch. You look damn well when you're dressed. Thanks, Stephen said. I can't wear them if they're gray. He can't wear them, Buck Mulligan told his face in the mirror. Etiquette is etiquette. He kills his mother, but he can't wear grey trousers. He folded his razor neatly, and with stroking palps of fingers felt the smooth skin. Stephen turned his gaze from the sea and to the plump face with its smoke-blue mobile eyes. That fellow I was with in the ship last night says you have GPI. He's up in Dottyville with Connolly Norman. General paralysis of the insane. He swept the mirror a half circle in the air to flash the tidings abroad in sunlight now radiant on the sea. His curling shaven lips laughed and the edges of his white glittering teeth. Laughter seized all his strong, well-knit trunk. Look at yourself, you dreadful bard. Stephen bent forward and peered at the mirror held out to him, cleft by a crooked crack, hair on end. As he and others see me, who chose this face for me, this dog's body to rid of vermin? It asks me too. I pinched it out of the skivvies room, Buck Mulligan said. It does her all right. The aunt always keeps plain looking servants for Malachy. Lead him not into temptation. And her name is Ursula. Laughing again, he brought the mirror away from Stephen's peering eyes. The rage of Caliban at not seeing his face in a mirror. If Wilde were only alive to see you. Drawing back and pointing, Stephen said with bitterness, "'Tis a symbol of Irish art, the cracked looking glass of a servant." Buck Mulligan suddenly linked his arm in Stephen's and walked with him round the tower, his razor and mirror clacking in his pocket where he had thrust them. "'Oh, it's not fair to tease you like that, Kinch, is it? God knows you have more spirit than any of them. Let Haynes stay, Stephen said. There's nothing wrong with him except at night. Well, then what is it? Cough it up. I'm quite frank with you. What have you against me now? They halted, looking towards the blunt cape of Bray Head that lay on the water like the snout of a sleeping whale. Stephen freed his arm quietly. Do you wish me to tell you? He asked. Yes, what is it? Uh, I don't remember anything. He looked in Stephen's face as he spoke. A light wind passed his brow, fanning softly his fair uncombed hair and stirring silver points of anxiety in his eyes. Stephen, depressed by his own voice, said, Do you remember the first day I went to your house after my mother's death? Buck Mulligan frowned quickly and said, What? Where? I can't remember anything. I remember only ideas and sensations. Why? What happened in the name of God? You were making tea, Stephen said, and I went across the landing to get more hot water. Your mother and some visitor came out of the drawing room. She asked you who was in your room. Yes. What did I say? I forget. You said... Oh, it's only Daedalus, whose mother is beastly dead. A flush, which made him seem younger and more engaging, rose to Buck Mulligan's cheek. Did I say that? Well, what harm is that? He shook his constraint from him nervously. And what is death? Your mother's or yours or my own? You saw only your mother die. I see them pop off every day in the Mater and Richmond and cut up into tripes in the dissecting room. It's a beastly thing and nothing else. It simply doesn't matter. You wouldn't kneel down to pray for your mother on her deathbed when she asked you. Why? Well, because you have the cursed Jesuit strain in you, only it's injected the wrong way. To me, it's all a mockery and beastly. Her cerebral lobes are not functioning. 
I mean, she pulls the doctor Sir Peter Teasel and picks buttercups off the quilt. Humor her till it's over. You crossed her last wish in death, and yet you sulk with me because I don't whinge like some hired mute from Lalouette's. Absurd. I suppose I did say it. I didn't mean to offend the memory of your mother. He had spoken himself into boldness. Stephen, shielding the gaping wounds which the words had left in his heart, said very coldly, I am not thinking of the offence to my mother. Well, of what then? Buck Mulligan asked. Of the offence to me, Stephen answered. Buck Mulligan swung round on his heel. Oh, an impossible person, he exclaimed. He walked off quickly round the parapet. Stephen stood at his post, gazing over the calm sea towards the headland. Sea and headland now grew dim. Pulses were beating in his eyes, veiling their sight, and he felt the fever of his cheeks. A voice within the tower called loudly, Are you up there, Mulligan? I'm coming, but Mulligan answered. He turned towards Stephen and said, Look at the sea. What does it care about offences? Oh, Chuck, Loyola Kinchin, come on down. The Sasserac wants his morning rashers. His head halted again for a moment at the top of the staircase, level with the roof. Don't mope over it all day. I'm inconsequent. Give up the moody brooding. His head vanished, but the drone of his descending voice boomed out of the stairhead. And no more turn aside and brood upon life, love's bitter mystery. For Fergus rules the brazen cars. Wood shadows floated silently by through the morning peace from the stairhead seaward where he gazed. Inshore and farther out, the mirror of water whitened, spurned by light shot hurrying feet. White breast of the dim sea, the twining stresses two by two a hand plucking the harp strings, merging their twining chords, wave white wedded words shimmering on the dim tide. A cloud began to cover the sun, slowly shadowing the bay in deeper green. It lay behind him, a bowl of bitter waters. Thank you. Thank you, Clive. Leading up to our next excerpt, Stephen leaves Buck Mulligan in the notorious swimming hole known as the 40 foot. He spends some time trying to teach a class in a school for the children of very rich parents. And he collects his pay from a pompous anti-Semitic pro-unionist headmaster, Mr. Deasy. Since it is a half holiday, Stephen heads off to Sandy Mount Strand to test out a variety of theories about the reality of existence. This third chapter is probably the most challenging to read. Fortunately for us, respite comes with Mr. Bloom's appearance in the next excerpt. The time is 8 a.m. on June 16th. 1904. But this time we are on the north side of the Liffey at number seven Eccle Street, the abode of Mr. and Mrs. Leopold Bloom. Leopold is up early because he will be attending the funeral of an acquaintance, Patty Dignam. He interacts with the family cat before going around the corner to buy a pork kidney for his breakfast. Daydreams about the Middle East, the original land of his ancestors, and fantasizes about the maid next door who happens to be in line before him at the butcher shop. Molly Bloom is still in bed because she will be receiving Blazes Boylan, her manager, in the afternoon to plan her upcoming tour, among other things. 
Leopold thinks of cats and mice while he is out during the day. Read the rest of the chapter to see what's at play. Liam Phelan Cox was born in Clonmel, County Tipperary, and schooled by Jesuits in London. He spent or misspent 49 years as a teacher and translator. He is a 45-year-old resident of St. Henri Park, a step away from the original Église des Irlandais in the Southwest. He remains a rebel. Liam? Do you hear me? Yes. Yes, go ahead. I begin. Mr. Leopold Bloom et with relish the inner organs of beasts and fowls. He likes thick giblet soup, nutty gizzards a stuffed roast heart, liver slices fly, fried with crust crumbs, fried hen cod's rolls. Most of all, he liked grilled mutton kidneys, which gave to his palate a fine tang of faintly scented urine. Kidneys were in his mind as he moved about the kitchen softly, writing her breakfast things on the humpy tray. Jellied light and air were in the kitchen, but out of doors, gentle summer morning everywhere made him feel a bit peckish. The coals were reddening. Another slice of bread and butter. Three, four, right. She didn't like her plate full. Right. He turned from the tray, lifted the kettle off the hob and set it sideways on the fire. It sat there dull and squat. Its spout stuck out. A cup of tea soon. Good. <laughs> Mouth dry. The cat walked stiffly round a leg of the table with tail on high. <sniffs> oh, there you are, Mr. Bloom said, turning from the fire. The cat mewed in answer and stalked again stiffly round the leg of the table, mewing. Just how she stalks over my writing table. Oh, oh, scratch my head. Oh. Mr. Bloom watched curiously, kindly, the lithe black form. Clean to see. The gloss of her sleek hide. The white button under the butt of her tail. The green flashing eyes. He bent down to her, his hands on his knees. Milk for the pussons he said. <laughs> the cat cried. He halted before Juglash's window, staring at the hanks of sausages, polonies, black and white. Fifteen multiplied by... The figures whitened in his mind, unsolved. Displeased, he let them fade. The shiny links, packed with forcemeat, fed his gaze, and he breathed in tranquilly the lukewarm breath of cooked spicy pig's blood. Mr. Bloom pointed quickly uh, to catch up and walk behind her if she went slowly, behind her moving hams. Oh, pleasant to see first thing in the morning. Hurry up, damn it, make hay while the sun shines. She stood outside the shop in sunlight and sauntered lazily to the right, he sighed down his nose. Can't they never understand? Soda-chapped hands, crusted toenails too, brown scapulars and tatters defending her both ways. The sting of disregard glowed to weak pleasure within his breast. And for another, a constable off duty, cuddling her in Eccles Lane. 
They like them sizable. <laughs> Prime sausage. Oh, please, Mr. Paulisman, I'm lost in the wood. Trapence, please. Thank you, sir. Another time. Two letters and a card lay on the hall floor. He stooped and gathered them. Mrs. Marion Bloom. His quickened heart slowed at once. Bold hand, Mrs. Marion. Holdy! Entering the bedroom, he half closed his eyes and walked through warm yellow twilight towards her tousled head. Who are the letters for? He looked at them. Mullingar, Millie. A letter from me from Millie, he said carefully, and a card to you, and a letter for you. He laid her card and letter on the quill bedspread near the curve of her knees. Do you want the blind drop? He prodded a fork into the kidney and slapped it over, then fitted the teapot on the tray. Its hump bumped as he took it up. Everything on it, bread and, and butter, Four, sugar, spoon, her cream. Yes. He carried it upstairs, his thumb inside the teapot handle. Nudging the door open with his knee, he carried the tray in and set it on the chair by the bedhead. What a time you were, she said. She doubled a slice of bread into her mouth, asking, what time is the funeral? Oh, 11, I think, he answered. I didn't see the paper. There's a smell of burn, she said. Did you leave Anton on the fire? Oh, the kidney, he cried suddenly. End of segment. Thank you. Thank you, Liam. Thank you very much. Liam Bull Bloom goes to the post office and under the assumed name of Henry Flower, he collects a letter from his clandestine pen pal known only as Martha Clifford. He visits a pharmacy run by Mr. Sweeney and heads for the public bathhouse to use the bar of lemon soap as he bathes in preparation for attending the funeral of Patty Dignam at 11 a.m. Leopold then joins the funeral procession as it wends its way from Dignam's house in Sandy Cove and through the city to Prospect Cemetery in Glasnevin. He thinks about life and death and about his son Rudy who died at 11 days old, 11 years ago. In the Odyssey, Ulysses has been given a bag containing all of the unfavorable winds which could prevent his sailing safely home. His men suspect that he's hiding treasure from them. When he falls asleep, the sailors open it, let the winds loose, and they are blown off course. In this chapter, Leopold Bloom visits the newspaper office at 12 noon in his capacity as an advertising canvasser. He has an ad which he wants published for a client, but he needs to add the artwork. Doors open and close, breezes blow, and a lot of hot air is generated as the printing presses blast away almost like living, breathing entities preparing to get the word out. Howard Krosnick is a past president of the Jewish Public Library and spent most of his working years at TV Ontario, the National Film Board of Canada and Federation CJA. He's been reading Joyce off and on since he found Ulysses as a 12-year-old poking around in his parents' bookshelves. He didn't understand it then, and after 63 years, 
He thinks he understands it a bit better. At least, he says, it's easier than the wake. Hello, I think I'm unmuted, but I'm not seen. Aha. Aeolus, in the heart of the Hibernian metropolis. Before Nelson's pillar, Trams slowed, shunted, changed trolley, started for Blackrock, Kingstown, and Dalkey, Klonscape, Rathgar, and Terraner, Palmerston Park, and Upper Rathmines, Sandy Mount Green, Rathmines, Rings End, and Sandy Mount Tower, Harold's Cross, the Horse Dublin United Tramway Company's timekeeper, Balled them off. Rathgar and Terriner, right and left, parallel, clanging, ringing, a double decker and a single deck, moved from their railheads, swerved to the downline, glided parallel. Start Palmerston Park. The wearer of the crown. Under the porch of the general post office, Shoe blacks called and polished, parked in North Prince's Street, His Majesty's vermilion mail cars, bearing on their sides the royal initials E.R., received loudly flung sacks of letters, postcards, letter cards, parcels, insured and paid for local, provincial, British, and overseas delivery. Gentlemen of the press, gross booted draymen rolled barrels, dull thudding out of Prince's stores and bumped them up on the brewery float. On the brewery, brewery float bumped dull thudding barrels rolled by gross booted draymen out of Prince's stores. There it is, Red Murray said. Alexander Keyes. Just cut it out, will you? Mr. Bloom said, and I'll take it around to the telegraph office. The door of Rutledge's office creaked again. Davy Stevens, minute in a large cape coat, a small felt hat crowning his ringlets, passed out with a roll of papers under his cape, a king's courier. Red Murray's long shears sliced out the advertisement from the newspaper in four clean strokes. Scissors and paste. I'll go through the printing works, Mr. Bloom said, taking the cut square. Of course, if he wants a par, Red Murray said earnestly, a pen behind his ear, we can do him one. Right, Mr. Bloom said with a nod. I'll rub that in. We, William Braden Esquire of Oakland's Sandy Mount. Red Murray touched Mr. Bloom's arm with the shears and whispered, Mr. Bloom turned and saw the liveried porter raise his lettered cap as a stately figure entered between the newsboards of the Weekly Freeman and the National Press and the Freeman's Journal and National Press. Dull thudding Guinness's barrels. It passed stately up the staircase, steered by an umbrella, a solemn beard framed face. The broad cloth back ascended each step back. All his brains are in the nape of his neck, Simon Dedalus says. Welts of flesh behind on him, fat folds of neck, fat neck, fat neck. The door of Rutledge's office whispered, E, Cree, 
They always build one door opposite another for the wind to way in, way out. Our savior, beard framed oval face, talking in the dusk, Mary, Martha, steered by an umbrella sword to the footlights, Mario the tenor. Or like Mario, Mr. Bloom said. Yes, Red Marie agreed, but Mario was said to be the picture of our savior. Jesus Mario with rouge cheeks, doublet and spindle legs, hand on his heart in Martha. Come, thou lost one, come, thou dear one. The Crozier and the Pen. His grace phoned down twice this morning, Red Murray said gravely. They watched the knees, the legs, the boots vanish, neck. A telegram boy stepped in nimbly through an envelope on the counter and stepped off post haste with the word, Freeman. Mr. Bloom said slowly, well, he is one of our saviors also. A meek smile accompanied him as he lifted the counter flap. As he passed in through the side door and along the warm, dark stairs and passage, along the now reverberating boards. But will he save the circulation? Thumping, thumping. He pushed in the glass swing door and entered, stepping over strewn packing paper. Through a lane of clanking drums, he made his way toward Nanetti's reading closet. How a great daily organ is turned out. Well, oh, excuse me. With unfeigned regret, it is that we announce the of a most respected Dublin Burgess. Heinz here too, account to the funeral probably. Thumping, thump. This morning, the remains of the late Mr. Patrick Dignam Machines smash a man to atoms if they got caught. Rule the world today. His machines are pegging away to, like these got out of hand, fermenting, working away, tearing away, and that old gray rat tearing to get in. How a great daily organ is turned out. Mr. Bloom halted behind the foreman's spare body admiring a glossy crown. Strange, he never saw his real country, Ireland, my country, member for college green. He boomed that workaday worker tack for all it was worth. It's the ads and side features sell a weekly, not the stale news in the official gazette. Queen Anne is dead, published by authority in the year 1000 and Demen, situate in the townland of Rosinalis, barony of Tinajich. To all who may concern, schedule pursuant to statute, showing return of number of mules and genets exported from Balina. Nature notes. Cartoons. Phil Blake's weekly Pat and Bull story. Uncle Toby's page for tiny tots. Country bumpkins queries. Dear Mr. Editor, what is a good cure for flatulence? I'd like that part. Learn a lot teaching others. The personal note, M-A-P, mainly all pictures. Shapely bathers on the golden strand, world's biggest balloon, double marriage of sisters celebrated, two bridegrooms laughing heartily at each other. Kuprani, too. Printer, more Irish than the Irish. The machines clanked in three, four time. Thump, thump, thump. Now, if he got paralyzed there and no one knew how to stop them, they'd crank on and on the same, print it over and over and up and back, monkey doodle the whole thing. Want a cool head. Well, get it into the evening edition, counselor, Hines said. Soon be calling him my lord. Long John is backing him, they say. The foreman, without answering, 
scribbled press on a corner of the sheet and made a sign to the typesetter. He handed the sheet silently over the dirty glass screen. Right, thanks, Heim said, moving off. Mr. Bloom stood in his way. If you want to draw, the cashier is just going to lunch, he said, pointing backward with his thumb. Did you? Hines asked. Hmm, Mr. Bloom said. Look sharp and you'll catch him. Thanks, old man, Hines said. I'll tap him too. He hurried on eagerly toward the Freeman's journal. Three bob I lent him in meagers. Three weeks, three hints. We see the canvasser at work. Mr. Bloom laid his cutting on Mr. Nanetti's desk. Excuse me, counselor, he said. This ad, you see, keys, you remember? Mr. Nanetti considered the cutting a while and nodded. He wants it in for July, Mr. Bloom said. He doesn't hear it, Nanan, Irish nerves. The foreman moved his pencil toward it. But wait, Mr. Bloom said, he wants it changed. Keys, you see, he wants two keys at the top. Hell of a racket they make. Maybe he understands what I. The foreman turned around to hear patiently and lifting an elbow began to scratch slowly in the armpit of his alpaca jacket. Like that, Mr. Bloom said, crossing his fingers at the top. Let him take that in first. Mr. Bloom, glancing sideways up from the cross he had made, saw the foreman's shallow face. Think he has a touch of jaundice and beyond the obedient reels feeding in huge webs of paper. Clank it, clank it, miles of it unreeled. What becomes of it after? Oh, wrap up meat, parcels, various uses. Thousand and one things. Sh slipping his words deftly into the pauses of the clanking, he drew swiftly on the scared woodwork. House of keys. Like that, see? Two crossed keys here, a circle, then here the name Alexander Keys, tea, wine, and spirit merchant, so on. Better not teach him his own business. You know yourself, counselor, just what he wants. Then round the top and leaded the house of keys. You see, do you think that's a good idea? The foreman moved his scratching hand to his lower ribs and scratched there quietly. The idea, Mr. Bloom said, is the house of keys. You know, counselor, the Manx parliament, innuendo of home rule. Tourists, you know, from the Isle of Man. Catches the eye, you see. Can you do that? I could ask him perhaps about how to pronounce that Voglio, but then if he didn't know, only make it awkward for him, better not. We can do that, the foreman said. Have you the design? I can get it, Mr. Bloom said. It was in a Kilkenny paper. He has a house there too. I'll just run out and ask him. Well, you can do that and just a little par calling attention. You know, the usual high class licensed premises, long felt want, and so on. The foreman thought for an instant. We can do that, he said. Let him give us three months renewal. A typesetter brought him a limp galley page. He began to check it silently. Mr. Bloom stood by, hearing the loud throbs of cranks, watching the silent typesetters at their cases. Orthographical. Want to be sure of his spelling. Proof fever. Martin Cunningham forgot to give us his spelling bee conundrum this morning. It is amusing to view the unpar one are uh, allowed and bara two R's, is it? Double S meant of a harassed peddler while gouging 
Oh, the symmetry of a peeled pear under a cemetery wall. Silly, isn't it? Cemetery put in, of course, on account of the symmetry. I could have said when he clapped on his topper, thank you. I ought to have said something about an old hat or something. No, I could have said, looks as good as new now. See his fizz then. Slit. The nethermost deck of the first machine jogged forwards its flyboard with slit. The first batch of choir folded papers slit. Almost human the way it slit to call attention doing its level best to speak. That door too slit, creaking, asking to be shut. Everything speaks in its own way. Slit. Thank you, Howard. After Leopold and Stephen almost meet at the newspaper offices, Leopold has lunch at Davy Burns Pub. Afterwards, in search of the graphic material for the ad, Leopold looks for the design suitable for the pun on the name of the tea merchant, Keys. In the meantime, in the same location, Stephen holds forth about his theory on the relationship between Hamlet's father's ghost and Shakespeare's father, another non-meeting occurs. At three o'clock, almost everyone seems to be on the move. The Viceroy is in his carriage on the way to open a charity event. Bloom hunts for a racy novel for his wife. Blazes Boylan flirts with a shop girl as he buys gifts to bring to his romantic rendezvous with Molly. He then goes into the Ormond Hotel for a drink before he meets her. The two barmaids put on a show for the gents in the bar. Polyphemus, one of the Cyclops, holds Ulysses and his men prisoner with the intention of eating them alive. Ulysses gives him wine to put him to sleep and then pokes his eye out to blind him so he and his men can escape. The action of this chapter occurs at 5 p.m. with a nameless narrator complaining about nearly having an eye poked out by a chimney sweep while on his way to where the larger than life citizen holds court in Barney Kiernan's pub. The citizen is an ultra nationalist anti Semite. Fantasy and reality compete for the minds of those present. What is the truth? Listen for the over the top exaggerations as Joyce makes fun of the citizen's prejudices. If you want to know what happens to Leopold when he stumbles into this den of dim wittery, you'll have to read the rest of the chapter to see how he avoids getting eaten alive. I will be reading this excerpt. In case you didn't know, my name is Kevin Wright. I'm the president of Festival Bloomsday Montreal and I am the chief navigator of the Boaters and Sifters of Alp, the Montreal Finnegan's Wake reading group. I also am a member of the Ulysses reading group. Cyclops. I was just passing the time of day with old Troy of the DMP at the corner of Arbor Hill there, and be damned, but a bloody sweep came along and he near drove his gear into me eye. I turned around to let him have the weight of my tongue when who should I see dodging along Stony Batter? Only Joe Hines. Lo, Joe, says I, how are you blowing? Did you see that bloody chimney sweep near shove me eye out with his brush? Soot's luck, says Joe. 
Who's the old bollocks you were talking to? Oh, old Troy, says I, was in the force. I'm on two minds not to give that fellow in charge for obstructing the thoroughfare with his brooms and ladders. What are you doing around those parts, says Joe? Devil a much, says I. There's a bloody big foxy thief beyond by the garrison church at the corner of Chicken Lane. Old Troy was just giving me a wrinkle about him. Lifted any God's quantity of tea and sugar to pay three bob a week, said he. Had a farm in the county down off a hop of my thumb by the name of Moses Herzog over there near Hatesbury Street. Circumcised, says Joe. Aye, says I, a bit off the top. An old plumber named Garrity. I'm hanging on to his taw now for the past fortnight, and I can't get a penny out of him. That's the lay you're on now, says Joe. Aye, says I, how are the mighty fallen, collector of bad and doubtful debts? But that's the most notorious bloody robber you'd meet in a day's walk, and the face on him, all pockmarks, would hold a shower of rain. Tell him, says he, I dare, says he, and double dare him to send you round here again. Or if he does, says he, I'll have him summonsed up before the court, so will I, for trading without a license. And he, after stuffing himself till he's fit to burst, Jesus, I had to laugh at the little Jewy getting his shirt out. He drink me my teas, he eat me my sugars, because he no pay me my monies. For non-perishable goods, bought of Moses Herzog of 13 St. Kevin's Parade, Wood Key Ward, merchant, hereinafter called the vendor, and sold and delivered to Michael E. Garrity, Esquire, of 29 Arbor Hill in the city of Dublin, Aaron Key Ward, gentlemen, hereinafter called the purchaser, Vidaliket, five pounds of Wardupois of first choice tea at three shillings per pound of Wardupois and three stone of Wardupois of sugar, crushed crystal at three pence per pound of War du Pois, the said purchaser, debtor to the said vendor of one pound, five shillings and sixpence sterling for the value received, which amount shall be paid by said purchaser to said vendor in weekly installments every seven calendar days of three shillings and no pence sterling. And the said non-perishable goods shall not be pawned or pledged or sold or otherwise alienated by the said purchaser but shall be and remain and be held to be the sole and exclusive property of the said vendor to be disposed of at his goodwill and pleasure until the said amount shall have been duly paid by the said purchaser to the said vendor in the manner herein set forth as this day hereby agreed between the said vendor his heirs, successors, trustees, assigns of the one part, and the said purchasers, his heirs, successors, trustees, and assigns of the other part. Are you a strict teetotaler? Says Joe. Not taking anything between drinks, says I. What about paying our respects to our friend? Says Foe. Who? Says I. Sure, he's in John of God's off his head, poor man. Drinking his own stuff, says Joe. Aye, says I, whiskey and water on the brain. Come around to Barney Kiernan, says Joe. I want to see the citizen. Barney Mavornings, be it, says I. Anything strange or wonderful, Joe? Not a word, says Joe. I was up at that meeting in the city arms. What was that, Joe, says I. Cattle traders, says Joe, about the foot and mouth disease. I want to give the citizen the hard word about it. So we went around by the linen hall barracks in the back of the courthouse, talking of one thing or another. 
decent fellow, Joe, when he has it. But sure, like that, he never has it. Jesus, I couldn't get over that bloody foxy Garrity. The daylight robber for trading without a license, says he. So we turned into Barney Kiernan's. And there, sure enough, was the citizen. Up in the corner having a great confab with himself. And that bloody mangy mongrel, Gary Owen. And he waiting for what the sky would drop in the way of drink. There he is, says I, in his glory hole with his Krushkin lawn and his load of papers working for the cause. The bloody mongrel let out a grouse out of him would give you the creeps. Be a corporal work of mercy if someone would take the life of that bloody dog. I'm told for a fact that he ate a good part of the breeches off a constabulary man in Santry that came round one time with a blue paper about a license. Stand and deliver, says he. That's all right, citizen, says Joe. Friends here. Pass, friends, says he. Then he rubs his hand in his eye and he says... What's your opinion of the times? Doing the rappery and Rory of the Hill, but begob, Joe was equal to the occasion. I think the markets are on a rise, says he, sliding his hand down his fork. So begob, the citizen claps his claw on his knee and he says, foreign wars is the cause of it. And says Joe, sticking his thumb in his pocket, it's the Russians wish to tyrannize. Arrah, give over your bloody cotting, Joe, says I. I've got a thirst on me I wouldn't sell for half a crown. Give it a name, citizen, says Joe. Wine of the country, says he. What's yours, says Joe. Ditty Macanaspi, says I. Three pints, Terry, says Joe. And how's the old heart, citizen, says he? Never better, Achara, says he. What, Gary? Are we going to win, eh? And with that, he took the bloody old Towser by the scruff of the neck, and by Jesus, he never, nearly throttled him. The figure, seated on a large boulder at the foot of a round tower, was that of a broad-shouldered, deep-chested, strong-limbed, frank-eyed, red-haired, freely-freckled, shaggy-bearded, wide-mouthed, large-nosed, long-headed, deep-voiced, bare-kneed, brawny-handed, hairy-legged, ruddy-faced, sinewy-armed hero. From shoulder to shoulder, he measured several L's, and his rock-like mountainous knees were covered as was likewise the rest of his body wherever visible with a strong growth of tawny prickly hair in hue and toughness similar to the mountain gorse Ulex Europaeus. The wide winged nostrils from which bristles of the same tawny hue projected were of such capaciousness that within their cavernous obscurity the field lark might easily have lodged her nest. The eyes in which a tear and a smile strove ever for the mastery were of the dimensions of a good-sized cauliflower. A powerful current of warm breath issued at regular intervals from the profound cavity of his mouth, while in rhythmic resonance the loud, strong hail reverberations of his formidable heart thundered, rumbling, causing the ground, the summit of the lofty tower and the still loftier walls of the cave to vibrate and tremble. He wore a long, unsleeved garment of recently flayed oxhide, reaching to the knees in a loose kilt, and this was bound about his middle by a girdle of plaited straw and rushes. Beneath this, 
He wore trues of deerskin roughly stitched with gut. His nether extremities were encased in high ball brigand buskins dyed in lichen purple, the feet being shod with brogues of salted cowhide laced with the windpipe of the same beast. From his girdle hung a row of sea stones which dangled at every movement of his portentous frame and on those were graven with rude yet striking art the tribal images of many Irish heroes and heroines of antiquity. Cahulan, Khan of a hundred battles, Nile of the nine hostages, Brian of Kinkora, the Ardri Malachi, Art McMurrah, Shane O'Neill, Father Bra John Murphy, Owen Rowe, Patrick Sarsfield, Red Hugh O'Donnell, Red Jim McDermott, Sogarth, Ian O'Growney, Michael Dwyer, Francie Higgins, Henry Joy McCracken, Goliath, Horace Wheatley, Thomas Conneff, Peg Woofington, The Village Blacksmith, Captain Moonlight, Captain Boycott, Dante Alighieri, Christopher Columbus, St. Fursa, St. Brendan, Marshall McCann, Charlemagne, Theobald Wolf Tone, the mother of the Maccabees, the last of the Mohicans, the Rose of Castile, the man for Galway, the man that broke the bank at Monte Carlo, the man in the gap, the woman who didn't, Benjamin Franklin, Napoleon Bonaparte, John L. Sullivan, Cleopatra, Savournine Delish, Julius Caesar, Paracelsus, Sir Thomas Lipton, William Tell, Michelangelo, Hayes, Mohammed, the Bride of Lammermoor, Peter the Hermit, Peter the Packer, Dark Rosaline, Patrick W. Shakespeare, Brian Confucius, Murtaugh Gutenberg, Patricio Velasquez, Captain Nemo, Tristan and Isolde, the first Prince of Wales, Thomas Cook and Son, the bold soldier boy, Ara Napog, Dick Turpin, Ludwig Beethoven, the Colleen Bond, Wadler Healy, Angus the Coldy, Dolly Mount, Sydney Parade, Ben Hoth, Valentine Great Rakes, Adam and Eve, Arthur Wellesley, Boss Croker, Herodotus, Jack the Giant Killer, Gautama Buddy, Lady Godiva, the La Lily of Carlarney, Baylor of the Evil Eye, the Queen of Sheba, Aki Nagel, Joe Nagel, Alessandro Volta, Jeremiah O'Donovan Rossa, Don Philip O'Sullivan Bear. A crouched spear of accumulated granite rested by him while at his feet reposed a savage, a savage animal of the canine tribe whose stertorous gasps announced that he was sunk in uneasy slumber, a supposition confirmed by hoarse growls and spasmodic movements with his master repressed from time to time by tranquilizing blows of a mighty cudgel rudely fashioned out of paleolithic stone. So anyhow, Terry brought the three pints Joe was standing and begob, the sight nearly left my eyes when I saw him land out a quid. Oh, as true as I'm telling you, a good looking sovereign. And there's more where that came from, says he. Were you robbing the poor box, Joe, says I. So out of my brow, says Joe. "'Twas the prudent member gave me the wheeze. "'I saw him before I met you,' says I, "'sloping around by Pill Lane and Greek Street "'with his cod's eye, counting up all the guts of the fish. "'Who comes through Mikan's land, bedight in sable armor? "'O Bloom, the son of Rory, it is he. "'Impervious to fear is Rory's son, "'he of the prudent soul. For the old woman of Princess Street, says the citizen, the subsidized organ, the pledged bound party on the floor of the house. And look at this blasted rag, says he. Look at this, says he. The Irish Independent, if you please, founded by Parnell to be the working man's friend. Listen to the births and deaths. 
in the Irish All for Ireland Independent, and I thank you in the marriages. And he starts reading them out. Gordon, Barnfield Crescent, Exeter, Redmayne of Ifley, St. Anne's on Sea, the wife of William T. Redmayne, of a son. How's that, eh? Wright and Flint, Vincent and Gillette, to Rotha Marion, daughter of Rosa and the late George Alfred Gillette, 179 Clapham Road, Stockwell, Playwood and Ridsdale, at St. Jude's, Kensington, by the very Reverend Dr. Forrest, Dean of Worcester. Eh? Deaths. Bristow, at Whitehall Lane, London. Carr, Stoke Newington, of gastritis and heart disease. Coburn at the Moat House, Chepstow. I knew that fellow, says Joe, from bitter experience. Coburn, Dimsey, wife of Davy Dimsey, late of the Admiralty. Miller, Tottenham, aged 85, Welsh, June 12th at 35 Canning Street, Liverpool. Isabella Helton, how's that for a national press? Eh, my brown son, what's that for Martin Murphy, the Bantry jobber? Ah, oh, well, says Joe, handing round the booze. Thanks be to God they had the start of us. Drink that, citizen. I will, says he, honorable person. Health, says Joe, says I, and all down the form. Oh, oh, don't be talking. I was blue moldy for the want of that pint. Declare to God I could hear it hit the pit of my stomach with a click. And lo, as they quaffed their cup of joy, a godlike messenger came swiftly in, radiant as the eye of heaven, a comely youth. And behind him there passed an elder of noble gait and countenance, bearing the sacred scrolls of law, and with him his lady wife, a dame of peerless lineage, fairest of her race. Little Alf Bergen popped in round the door and hid behind Barney Snug, squeezed up with the laughing, and who was sitting up there in the corner that I hadn't seen snoring, drunk, blind to the world, only Bob Doran. I didn't know what was up, and Alf kept making signs out of the door, and begob, what was it? Only that bloody old pantaloon Dennis Breen in his bath slippers, with two bloody big books tucked under his oxter, and the wife, hot foot after him, unfortunate wretched woman, trotting like a poodle. I thought Alf would split. Look at him, says he, Breen. He's traipsing all round Dublin with a postcard someone sent him with U.P. up on it. To take a lie, and he doubled up. Take a what, says I? A libel action, says he, for 10,000 pounds. Oh, hell, says I. The bloody mongrel began to growl that it put the fear of God in you seeing something was up. But the citizen gave him a kick in the ribs. Be gohushed, says he. Who, says Joe? Breen, says Alf. He was in John Henry Menton's, and then he went round to Collison Ward's, and then Tom Rochford met him and sent him round to the sub-sheriffs for a lark. Oh, God, I've a pain laughing. You pee up. The Longfellow gave him an eye as good as a process, and now the bloody old lunatic is gone round to Green Street to look for a G-man. When is Long John going to hang that fellow in Mount Joy, says Joe? Bergen, says Bob Doran, waking up. Is that Alf Bergen? Yes, says Alf. Hanging? Wait till I show you here. Terry, give us a pony. That bloody old fool. Ten thousand pounds. You should have seen Long John's eye. You pee! And he started laughing. Who are you laughing at, says Bob Doran. Is that Bergen? Hurry up, Terry boy, says Alf. Terence O'Ryan heard him and straightway brought him a crystal cup 
full of the foaling, foaming ebon ale, which the noble twin brothers, Bung Ivy and Bung Ardulon, brew ever in their divine ale vats, cunning as the sons of deathless Leda, for they garner the succulent berries of the hop and mass and sift and bruise and brew them and they mix therewith sour juices and bring the must to the sacred fire and cease not night or day from their toil. Those cunning brothers, lords of the vat. Then did you, chivalrous Terence, hand forth as to the manner born that nectarous beverage and you offered the crystal cup to him that thirsted, the soul of chivalry in beauty akin to the immortals. But he, the young chief of the Obergans, could ill brook to be outdone in generous deeds, but gave therefore with gracious gesture a testoon of costliest bronze, thereon embossed in excellent smithwork was seen the image of a queen of regal port, scion of the house of Brunswick, Victoria, her name. Her most excellent majesty by grace of God of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland and of the British domains, dominions beyond the sea, queen, defender of the faith, empress of India, even she, who bore rule a victress over many peoples, the well-beloved, for they knew and loved her from the rising of the sun to the going down thereof, the pale, the dark, the ruddy, and the Ethiop. What's that bloody Freemason doing, says the citizen, prowling up and down outside. What's that, says Joe. Here you are, says Alf, chucking out the rhino, talking about hanging. I'll show you something you never saw. Hangman's letters. Look at here. So he took a bundle of wisps of letters and envelopes out of his pocket. Are you cutting, says I. Honest Injun, says Alf. Read them. So Joe took up the letters. Who are you laughing at, says Bob Doran. So I saw there was going to be a bit of a dust. Bob's a queer chap when the porter's up in him. So says I, just to make talk. How's Willie Murray those times, Alf? I don't know, says Alf. I saw him just now in Capel Street with Patty Dignam. Only I was running after that. You what, says Joe, throwing down the letters. With who? With Dignam, says Alf. Is it Patty, says Joe? Yes, says Alf. Why? Don't you know? He's dead, says Joe. Patty Dignam, dead, says Alf. Aye, says Joe. Trim after seeing him not five minutes ago, says Alf, as plain as a pike staff. Who's dead, says Bob Doran. You saw his ghost then, says Joe. God between us and harm. What, says Alf. Good Christ, only five. What? And Willie Murray with them, the two of them near Whatchamacallums. What? Dignam dead? What about Dignam, says Bob Doran? Who's talking about dead, says Alf? He's no more dead than you are. Maybe so, says Joe. But they took the liberty of burying him this morning anyhow. End of the chapter. Now, after barely escaping from the Ash ultra nationalist enclave, Leopold goes to the same beach where Stephen tested his theories of reality earlier in the morning. Some young ladies and some young children are out on the beach. Gertie McDowell catches Leopold's eye and he sees something more interesting than the religious service in the nearby church. The scene is climactic to say the least. After that, Leopold has business elsewhere. When Pat Machen decided to move from teaching in an elementary school 
to teaching in a high school, the principal of the latter asked the principal of the former what she should teach. Oh, she should teach English. She loves to read out loud. And that is how Pat got to be a high school English teacher. She still likes to read out loud. Pat Machen. Auction of the Sun. Dish la hora simus. Dish la homus imus. Dish lil homus imus. Send us bright one, light one, horn, horn, quickening and womb fruit. Send us bright one, light one, whore, horn, quickening and womb fruit. Send us bright one, light one, whore, horn, quickening and womb fruit. Fruit. Hoops, a boys, a boys, a hoops, a hoops, a boys, a boys, a hoops, a hoops. It is not why, therefore, we should wonder if, as in the best historians relate, among the Celts, who nothing that was not in its nature admirable admired, the art of medicine shall have been highly honored. Not to speak of hostels, leper yards, sweating chambers, plague graves, their greatest doctors, the O'Shields, the O'Hickeys, the O'Leals, have sedulously set down the diverse methods by which the sick and the relapsed found again health, whether the malady had been the trembling withering or loose with carnal flux. Certainly, in every public work which in it anything of gravity contains, preparation should be with importance commensurate, and therefore a plan was by them adopted. Whether by pre preconsidered or as the maturation of experience, it is difficult in being said which the discrepant opinions of subsequent inquirers are not up to the present congruent to render manifest. Whereby maternity was so far from all accident possibility removed that whatever care the patient in that all hardest of women are chiefly required and not solely for the copiously opulent, but also for her who not being sufficiently moneyed, scarcely, and not often not even scarcely, could subsist valiantly. And for an inconsiderable emolument was provided. Before born bliss babe had, within whom one he worshipped. Whatever in that one case was done commodulously, done what? A couch by midwives attended with wholesome food, reposeful, cleanest swaddles, as though forth bringing were not now done, and by wise foresight set. But to this no less of what drugs there is need and surgical implements which are pertaining to her case, not omitting aspect of the all very distracting spectacles in various latitudes by our terrestrial orb offered together with images, divine and human. The cogitation of which by sage young females is to tumescence conducive or is its issue in the high sunbright, well-built, fair home of mothers when ostensibly far gone and reproductive 
It is come by her thereto to lie in her term up. Some man that wayfaring was stood by house door at night's oncoming. Of Israel's folks was that man that on earth wandering far had fared. Stark roof of man, his errand that him lone led till that house. Of that house, a horn is Lord. Seventy beds keeps he there. Teeming mothers are wont that they lie for to throw and bring forth bairns. Hail, so God's angel to Mary quote. Watchers pray their walk white sisters in ward sleepless. Smarts they still, sickness soothing. In twelve months, moons, thrice an hundred. Truest bedthanes they twain are for home holding wariest ward. In ward weary, the watcher, hearing come that man mild hearted, ever rising, with swire, swire e wimple, to him her gate wide undid. Lo, leaven leaping lightens, and I blink Ireland's westward welkin. Full she drad that God, the wrecker, all mankind would foredo with water for his evil sins. Christ's roods made she on breast foam, and him drew that he would rather in fair under her thatch. That man, her will Watting worthful went in Horn's house. The man that was come to the house that spake to the nursing woman and he asked her how it fared with the woman that lay there in childhood bed. The worst nursing wom woman answered him and said that the woman was in throes now three full days and it would be a hard birth beneath the bear but that now, in a little while, it would be. She said there too, that she'd seen many births of women, but never was none so hard as was the, that woman's birth. Then she set it all forced to him because she knew the man that time was that lived nigh that house. The man hearkened her words, for he felt with wonder woman's woe in the travail that they have of motherhood. And he wondered to look on her face. That was a fair face for any man to see, but yet was she left after long years a handmaid. Nine, twelve blood flows chiding her childless. And was they spoke, the door of the castle was opened, and there nigh them a mickle noise, as if many that sat there at meat. This meanwhile, this good sister stood by the door and begged them at the reverence of Jesu, our author, liege lord, to leave their wassailing. For there was above one quick with child, a gentle dame, whose time hide fast. Excuse me, sorry. <laughs> she said that there too, she had been seeing many births of women, but never was named so hard as was that woman's birth. Then she set it forth to him because she knew the man at that time had lived nigh that house. The man hearkened for her words, for he felt with wonder the woman's woe. And whilst they spake, the mickle noise above continued. This meanwhile, this good sister stood by the door and begged them at the reverence of God to be quiet. Sir Leopold on the up floor cry on high and he wondered what cry that it was, whether of child or woman. And I marvel, said he, that it not come or now. Me seems it dureth over long. And he was where and saw Franklin that height Linehan on the side of the table that was older than any t'other. And from that, they both were knights virtuous in that one emprise and eat by cause that he was elder. He spoke to him gently. But, said he, 
or it be long too, she will bring forth by God his bounty and have joy of her childing, for she hath waited marvelous long. And the Franklin that had drunken said, expecting each moment to be her next. Also, he took the cup that stood to for him, for him needed never none asking or desiring of him to drink. And now drink, said he, fully, delectably. And he quaffed as far as he might to their both health, for he was a passing good man of his lustiness. And Sir Leopold, that was the goodliest guest that ever sat in scholar's hall and was the meekest man and the kindest that ever laid husbandly hand under his hen. And that was the very truest knight of the world, one that never did minion service to lady gentle, pledged him courtly in the cup. Woman's woe with wonder pondering. So, Thursday, 16th June. Dignum laid in clay of an apoplexy, and after hard drought, please God, rained. A bargeman coming in by water of 50 mile or thereabouts with turf saying, the seed won't sprout. Fields of thirst, very sad colored and stunk mightily. The quags and toffs too, hard to breathe. And all the young quicks cleaned, consumed, without sprinkle, this long while back, as no man remembered to be without. But, by and by, I said, this evening, after sundown, the wind, sitting in the west, biggish, swollen clouds to be seen as the night increased, and the weather wise pouring up at them, and some sheet lightnings at first, and after, past ten of the clock, one great stroke with a long thunder. And a brace of shakes all scamper pell-mell within door with a smoking shower. The men making shelter with their straws with clout or kerchief. Women folk skipping off with kirtles catched up soon as the pour came down. The news was imparted with a circumspection recalling the ceremonial usage of the sublime port by the second female in fair Mariam to the junior medical officer in residence, who in his turn announced to the delegation that an heir had been born. When he had betaken himself to the woman's apartment to assist in the prescribed ceremony of the afterbirth, in the presence of the Secretary of State for Domestic Affairs and the members of the Privy Council, silent in unanimous exhaustion and approbation, the delegates, chafing under the length and solemnity of their vigil and hoping that the joyful occurrence would palliate a license which the simultaneous absence of Abigail and obstetrician rendered the easier, broke out at once into a strife of tongues. In vain, the voice of Mr. Canvasser Bloom was heard endeavoring to urge, to mollify, to refrain. Burks out flung my Lord Stephen, giving the cry, and a tag and a bobtail of them all after, cockerel, jackapets, Welsher, pill doctor, punctual Bloom at the heels with a universal grabbing at hen gear ash plants, billboards, Panama hats, and scabbards, zermits, alpenstocks, and whatnot. A dedale of lusty youth, noble every student there. Nurse Callan took a back in the hallway, cannot stay them, or smiling surgeon coming downstairs with news of plantation ended, a full pound of milligram. The heart come on, the door, it opened. He, they out, tumultuously, off for a minute's race, all bravely legging it. Burks of Denzils and Halls, their ulterior goal. Dixon follows, giving them sharp language, but raps out an oath, he too and on. Bloom, 
stays with nurse, a thought to send a kind word to happy mother and nursling up there. Dr. Diet and Dr. Quiet, looks she too not other now? Ward of watching in Horn's house has told its tale in that washed out pallor. They all being gone, a glance of mother wit living, he whispers close in going, Madam, when comes the stork bird for thee? Lynch, hey, sign on, Denzel Lane this way, change here for body house. We too, she said, will seek the kiss where Shady Mary is. Right, oh, any old time. Le tabanter and cub bibulous sui. Whisper, who's the sooty Elva Johnny in the black duds? Hush, sinned again the light, and even now that day is at hand, and he will come to judge the world by fire. <laughs> but implementer scripturae, strike up a ballad. Then out spake medical Dick to his comrade, medical baby. Christical, who's this excrement yellow gospeler in the Marion Hall? Elijah is coming, washed in the blood of the lamb. Come on, you wine fizzling, gun sizzling, booze guzzling existences. Come on, you dog gun, bull necked, beetle proud, hog jowled, peanut brained, weasel, weasel eye four flushers, farce alarms and excess baggage. Come on, you triple extract of infamy. Alexander J. Christ Dowie, that's my name, that's yanked to glory most half of this planet from Frisco Beach to Vladivostok. The deity ain't no nickel dime bum show. I put it to you that he's on the square and corking fine business proposition. He's the grandest thing yet, and don't you forget it. Shouts salvation to King Jesus. You'll need to rise precious early, you sinner there, if you want to diddle the almighty God. <laughs> Not half. He's got a cough mixture with a punch in it for you, my friend, in his back pocket. Just you try it on. Thank you, Pat. We've, we've just heard the evolution of the English language from Anglo-Saxon to American slang. And in the meantime, Mrs. Purefoy has given birth to a son. All the medicals are on their way out in the rain to seek some kind of pleasure. And we'll find out what happens. The time is now 2 a.m. on Friday, June 17, 1904. The location is Bloom's house at number 7 Eccle Street, from where Leopold had left early in the morning of June 16th. He has just rescued Stephen from Bella Cohen's brothel in Tyrone Street and tried to sober him up by taking him to a cabman's shelter to eat something which barely passes for coffee and a bun. This is an echo of Buck Mulligan's imitation of a Eucharistic celebration in chapter one. Now, Leopold has brought the homeless Stephen home in the hope that he can save him. This chapter is a series of questions and answers, often compared to a catechism or to a press conference. It is in some ways a recapitulation of the most important events of the previous day with some new insights thrown in. 
This was supposed to be the last chapter of the book, and in early editions was marked with the big black dot at the end. Over the years, Susan Gilmore has been involved in a number of community productions, including variety shows, stage plays, radio plays, and dramatic readings. She has performed with the Montreal Bloomsday Group since its inception outdoors at McGill University in 2011. The global Bloomsday reading of Ulysses in 2013 was a highlight, bringing together the world in a reading of the complete text. This annual Montreal Bloomsday reading is a joy. Again, this year because of these exceptional circumstances, her husband, Alan Lombard, has agreed to read the role of questioner for this Zoom performance Greater love hath no man. <laughs> Ithaca, Susan, Allen. Starting united, both at normal walking pace from Beresford Place, they followed in the order named Lower and Middle Gardner Streets and Mountjoy Square West. Then, at reduced pace, each bearing left, Gardner's place by an inadvertence as far as the farther corner of Temple Street. Then, at reduced pace with interruptions of halt, bearing right, Temple Street North, as far as Hardwick Place. Of what did the duumvirate deliberate during their itinerary? Uh, music, literature, Ireland, Dublin, Paris, friendship, women, prostitution, diet, the influence of gaslight or the light of arc and glow lamps on the growth of adjoining paraheliotropic trees, exposed corporation emergency dust buckets, the Roman Catholic Church, ecclesiastical celibacy, the Irish nation, Jesuit education, careers, the study of medicine, the past day, the maleficent influence of the pre-Sabbath, Stephen's collapse. Did Bloom discover common factors of similarity between their respective like and unlike reactions to experience? No, both were sensitive to artistic impressions, musical in preference to plastic or pictorial. Both preferred a continental to an insular manner of life, a cisatlantic to a transatlantic place of residence. Both indurated by early domestic training and an inherited tenacity of heterodox resistance professed their disbelief in many orthodox religious, national, social, and ethical doctrines. Both admitted the alternately stimulating and obtunding influence of heterosexual magnetism. Were their views on some points divergent? <laughs> Stephen dissented openly from Bloom's views on the importance of dietary and civic self-help, while Bloom dissented tacitly from Stephen's views on the eternal affirmation of the spirit of man in literature. Was there one point on which their views were equal and negative? The influence of gaslight or electric light on the growth of adjoining paraheliotropic trees. What act? did Bloom make on their arrival at their destination? At the house steps of the fourth of the equidifferent uneven numbers, number seven, Eccles Street, he inserted his hand mechanically into the back pocket of his trousers to obtain his latch key. Was it there? It was in the corresponding pocket of the trousers which he had worn on the day but one preceding. Why was he doubly irritated? No, because he had forgotten, and because he remembered that he had reminded himself twice not to forget. What were then the alternatives before the premeditatively, respectively, and inadvertently keyless couple? To enter or not to enter, to knock or not to knock. Bloom's decision? A stratagem. Resting his feet on the dwarf wall, he climbed over the area railings, compressed his hat on his head, grasped 
two points that the lower union of rails and stiles lowered his body gradually by its length of five feet, nine inches and a half to within two feet, 10 inches of the area pavement and allowed his body to move freely in space by separating himself from the railings and crouching in preparation for the impact of the fall. Did he rise uninjured by concussion? Well, regaining new stable equilibrium, he rose uninjured, though concussed by the impact. Raised the latch of the area door by the exertion of force at its freely moving flange, and by leverage of the first kind applied to its fulcrum, gained retarded access to the kitchen throughout the subjacent scullery. Ignited a lucifer match by friction, set free inflammable coal gas by turning on the vent cock, lit a high flame which, by regulating, he reduced to quiescent candescence and lit, finally, a portable candle. Did the man reappear elsewhere? Hmm. After a lapse of four minutes, the glimmer of his candle was discernible through the trans semi-transparent semicircular glass fanlight over the hall door. The hall door turned gradually on its hinges. In the open spaces of the doorway, the man reappeared without his hat, with his candle. Did Stephen obey his sign? Yes. Entering softly, he helped to close and chain the door and followed softly along the hallway, the man's back and listed feet and lighted candle, past a lighted crevice of doorway on the left, and carefully down a turning staircase of more than five steps into the kitchen of Bloom's house. What did Bloom see on the range? Well, on the right, smaller hob, a blue enameled saucepan. On the left, larger hob, a black iron kettle. What did Bloom do at the range? He removed the saucepan to the left hob, rose, and carried the iron kettle to the sink in order to tap the current by turning the faucet to let it flow. Having set the half-filled kettle on the now burning coals, why did he return to the still flowing tap? To wash his soiled hands with a partially consumed tablet of Barrington's lemon-flavored soap, to which papers still adhered bought 13 hours previously for fourpence and still unpaid for, in fresh, never changing, ever changing water and dry them face and hands in a long red bordered Holland cloth passed over a wooden revolving roller. What additional didactic counsels did he similarly repress? Dietary, concerning the respective percentage of protein and caloric energy in bacon, salt ling and butter, the absence of the former in the last named and the abundance of the latter in the first named. Which seemed to the host to be the predominant qualities of his guest? Oh, confidence in himself, an equal and opposite power of abandonment and recuperation. How many previous encounters proved their pre-existing acquaintance? Well, two. The first in the lilac garden of Matthew Dillon's house, Medina Village, Kimmage Road, Round Town in 1887, in the company of Stephen's mother. Stephen then being of the age of five and reluctant to give his hand in salutation. The second in the coffee room of Breslin's hotel on a rainy Sunday in the January of 1892, in the company of Stephen's father and Stephen's granduncle. Stephen being then five years older. Had Bloom and Stephen been baptized and where and by whom, cleric or layman? Uh, Bloom three times by the Reverend Mr. Gilmer Johnston, M.A. alone in the Protestant Church of St. Nicholas without Coombe. By James O'Connor, Philip Gilligan and James Fitzpatrick together under a pump in the village of Swords and by the Reverend Charles Malone CC in the Church of the Three Patrons, Rathgar. Stephen, once, by the Reverend Charles Malone CC, alone in the Church of the Three Patrons, Rathgar. What two temperaments did they individually represent? The scientific, the artistic. Now, what is home without Plumtree's potted meat? Oh incomplete. 
with it an abode of bliss. Manufactured by George Plumtree, 23 Merchants Quay, Dublin, put up in four ounce pots and inserted by Councillor Joseph P. Nanetti, MP, Rotunda Ward, 19 Hardwick Street, under the obituary notices and anniversaries of deceases. The name on the label is Plum Tree, a plum tree in a meat pot, registered trademark. Beware of imitations, peat mott, trumpley, mop pat, yam true. In what order of precedence, with what attendant ceremony was the exodus from the house of bondage to the wilderness of inhabitation effected? Ah, lighted candle in stick, borne by bloom, Diaconal hat on ash plant, borne by Stephen. What did each do at the door of egress? Oh, Bloom set the candlestick on the floor. Stephen put the hat on his head. For what creature was the door of egress a door of ingress? For a cat. What spectacle confronted them when they, first the host, then the guest, emerged silently, doubly dark, from obscurity by a passage from the rear of the house into the penumbra of the garden. The heaven tree of stars hung with humid night blue fruit. What visible luminous sign attracted Bloom's, who attracted Stephen's gaze? In the second story rear of his Bloom's house, the light of a paraffin oil lamp with oblique shade projected on a screen of roller blind supplied by Frank O'Hara window blind curtain pole and revolving shutter manufacturers, 16 Onger Street. How did he elucidate the mystery of an invisible attractive person, his wife, Marion, Molly, Bloom, denoted by a visible splendid sign, a lamp? With indirect and direct verbal allusions or affirmations, with subdued affection and admiration, with description, with impediment, with suggestion. Both then were silent? Silent, each contemplating the other in both mirrors of the reciprocal flesh of their, his, not his fellow faces. Were they indefinitely inactive? Oh, at Stephen's suggestion, at Bloom's instigation, both first Stephen, then Bloom, in penumbra, urinated, their sides contiguous, their organs of micturition reciprocally rendered invisible by manual circumposition, their gazes. First Bloom's, then Stephen's, elevated to the rejected luminous and semi-luminous shadow. How did the centripetal remainder afford egress to the centrifugal departer? Well, by inserting the barrel of an originated male key in the hole of an unstable female lock, obtaining a purchase on the bow of the key and turning its wards from right to left, withdrawing a bolt from its staple, pulling inward spasmodically an obsolescent unhinged door and revealing an aperture for free egress and free ingress. What sound accompanied the union of their tangent, the disunion of their respectively centrifugal and centripetal hands? The sound of the peal of the hour of the night by the chime of the bells in the church of St. George. What echoes of that sound were by both and each heard? By Stephen, Liliata rutilantium turma circondet, lubilantium te virginium, chorus excipiat. By Bloom, hey ho, hey ho. Hey ho, hey ho. Alone, what did Bloom hear? The double reverberation of retreating feet on the heaven born earth, the double vibration of a Jew's harp in the resonant lane. What prospect of what phenomena inclined him to remain? Well, the disparition of three final stars, the diffusion of daybreak, the apparition of a new solar disk. Did he remain? With deep inspiration, he returned, re-traversing the garden, re-entering the passage, re-closing the door. 
With brief suspiration, he reassumed the candle, reascended the stairs, reapproached the door of the front room hall floor, and re-entered. What miscellaneous effects of female personal wearing apparel were perceived by him? A pair of new, inodorous, half-silk black ladies' hose, a pair of new violet garters, a pair of outside ladies' drawers of India mull, cut on generous lines, redolent of a Poppenax, jessamine, and Murati's Turkish cigarettes, and containing a long, bright steel safety pin, folded curvilinear, camisole of battest with thin lace border, an accordion underskirt of blue silk moiret. All these objects being disposed irregularly on the top of a rectangular trunk, quadruple battened, having capped corners with multicolored labels initialed on its four side and white lettering B C T. Brian Cooper Tweedy. Bloom's acts. He deposited the articles of clothing on a chair, removed his remaining articles of clothing, took from beneath the bolster at the head of the bed a folded long white nightshirt inserted his head and arms into the proper apertures of the nightshirt, removed a pillow from the head to the foot of the bed, prepared the bed linen accordingly, and entered the bed. How? With circumspection, as invariably when entering an abode, his own or not his own. With solicitude, the snake spiral springs of the mattress being old, the brass quoits and pendant viper radii loose and tremulous under stress and strain, prudently as entering a lair or ambush of lust or adders, lightly the less to disturb, reverently the bed of conception and of birth, of consummation of marriage and of breach of marriage, of sleep and of death. What did his limbs, when gradually extended, encounter? New, clean bed linen, additional odors, the presence of a human form, female, hers, the imprint of a human form, male, not his. Some crumbs, some flakes of potted meat recooked, which he removed. Then? He kissed the plump, mellow, yellow, smellow melons of her rump on each plump, melanous hemisphere in their mellow, yellow furrow with obscure, prolonged, provocative Ellen's melanous osculation. The visible signs of post-satisfaction? A silent contemplation. A tentative relation, a gradual abasement, a solicitous aversion approximate direction. What followed this silent action? Somnolent invocation, less somnolent recognition, incipient excitation, catechetical interrogation. In what posture? Well, listener reclined semi-lateral left, left hand under head, right leg extended in a straight line and resting on left leg flexed in the attitude of Giatellus fulfilled, recumbent, big with seed. Narrator, reclined laterally left with right and left legs flexed, the index finger and thumb of the right hand resting on the bridge of the nose in the attitude depicted in a snapshot photograph made by Percy Upjohn, the child man weary, the man child in the womb. Womb? Weary? He rests, he has traveled. With Sinbad the sailor and Tinbad the tailor and Linjinbad the jailer and Quinbad the whaler and Inbad the nailer and Finbad the failer and Binbad the bailer and Pinbad the paler and Minbad the mailer and Hinbad the hailer and Rinbad the railer and Dinbad the kailer and Binbad the quailer and Linbad the yaler and Zinbad the flailer. When going to dark bed. There was a square round Sinbad the sailor rocks, ox, egg in the nice at the bed of all the ox of the rocks of dark and bad, the bright daily. Where? 
period. Period. Thank you very much, Susan and Alan. This marks the end of the first part of the readings from the Epistle of James to the Hibernians. We'll now take a break for lunch and then return to hear what Molly Bloom has to say as she lies in bed thinking about love, life, birth, death, and anything else that crosses her mind as she tries to get back to sleep. If any of you do have the time, please go to www.bloomsdaymontreal.com and view the caricatures of James Joyce created by Craig Morris. They are online and available for viewing. Thank you very much until two o'clock. See you then. Have a good lunch. Bye.